Hi there, everyone. Welcome to the webinar. Today, I'm going to talk about innovative options for metatarsalgia. My name is Dr. T. Wynn. I am a functional podiatric medical doc, and I do minimally invasive surgery. You might be wondering what functional podiatry is. Functional podiatry looks at the biomechanical relationship of the foot to the entire body. And we take into account the holistic view of the individual, looking at different factors that may play a role in foot pain, and we try to correct for those things. So we're looking at a holistic view of a person to try to understand why they have pain at the level that they do and at the threshold that it took them to get there. This talk is for anyone who is looking to understand the different treatment options there is for pain at the ball of the foot, also known as metatarsalgia. This is going to be useful for you as well if you treat people like you're a physical therapist or you're a chiropractor, a reflexologist, even a dancer or a Pilates instructor. Anybody who has clients who might be dealing with foot pain, this is a really nice lecture for you to know what medical treatments there are. And there's a couple of home care options as well. So the objective for this talk today is to understand the anatomy of pain, the general foot structure, to know how to prevent and also self-treat should you have foot pain, and also understand and recognize some of the newer medical modalities that is currently available. Let's start with the anatomy. It's the easiest thing to start with. Looking at the photo, the ball of the foot is made up of five metatarsals that correspond with each toe. In this region, there are nerve bundles in between the metatarsals on top and on bottom of the foot. There are ligaments, there are tendons, there are joints and capsules that holds together the joint structures and muscles. The entire foot is influenced by everything up higher, including the Achilles tendon and even a tight hip. That can influence the way we walk and therefore influence how our feet structures respond to the world around us. The most common causes of metatarsalgia are these things right here, including injury, a surgery, repetitive stress, having weak foot muscles, a bunion deformity, hammer toe deformity, having a tight Achilles tendon, and even fat pad atrophy. There are non-medical causes for foot pain, including really worn out shoes, which I think a lot of us are guilty of. And the activity that we choose to do might be working at a job for eight, 10, 12 hours at a time without breaks in between. Those things can cause foot pain. What's nice about those things is that we can correct them and reduce our foot pain. To understand the foot is to really understand the architecture of the foot. There is a relative arc or a parabola of the foot that allows it to adapt to different terrains the way that it does. The foot has 26 bones and a multitude of connections, different joints. And it's really important to see and understand that one single joint, if that is off, it will influence everything else. This is just showing you what the relative parabola of the foot of a normal foot structure could look like. It varies just a little bit, but you can see that all of the metatarsals are not exactly aligned straight. There's a little curvature to that. This is what we want to achieve if we're ever looking to do surgery. We want to maintain this relative parabola. Bunions and hammer toes change the relationship of the foot in, by the way that it redistributes, redistributes balance. Once a bunion starts to form, a bunion is when this metatarsal bone here sticks out of the joint. It's not a growth of bone as a lot of people misunderstand that to be. It's actually the bone jutting out of the articulation. This can change the dynamics of the foot it changes the way we put pressure. So a bunion, when this starts to come out, you may start to experience pain more off the side of the foot. Hammer toes as well. When a hammer toe starts to develop, when the toes are no longer in its own lane, it changes the entire balance of the foot. 
which can lead to foot pain. A small note about having foot pain, acute versus chronic. Acute pain is necessary. It's essential for when you accidentally step on something and you pull back and you have that pain signal to tell you something's wrong. When your body is telling you something is wrong, you need to rest and pay attention to it. If this persists and you continue to walk on something that hurts, your body can get stuck in a state of inflammation that leads it to being chronic, meaning pain persisting for longer than a month or so. When pain is chronic, the treatment will get more challenging and it's going to take a longer time to treat it. So it's always a great idea to pay attention to when your feet hurts immediately so that it can be treated more effectively right away. The successful treatment is in understanding the root causes of foot pain. So the word metatarsalgia is just a general term. Metatarsal is the metatarsal bone and algia means pain. So it just means pain where the metatarsals are. Knowing the acute injury is happening, protecting and rest is the most essential part of the healing process. But if this pain gets um, deeper, um, it persists a lot longer than anticipated, then we do have to dig a little bit deeper about what's going on and what we can do about it for treatment. So in this talk, I'm going to talk about the five most common causes for metatarsalgia and the treatments. The first one is a callus. A callus can cause pain, and a callus is when there is hard tissue in an area of a high pressure point, and that is kind of a clue to something going on with your, with your foot. Another diagnosis, Morton's neuroma, maybe if you've heard of this, this is when the nerve gets pinched. The nerve in between your metatarsals is getting pinched, whether it's by a shoe or something else, and can cause inflammation and pain. Capsulitis and plantar plate dysfunction or complete tear. I grouped this together because they are in the relative same place anatomically. And these things can happen from a direct trauma, repetitive steroid injections, or even a bunion deformity. Having a tight Achilles tendon, um, maybe because of a medical condition that causes the collagen fibers to get stiff, like diabetes or rheumatoid arthritis, can cause foot pain. Even wearing high heels for a long time can lead to symptoms in the ball of the foot. And neglect, a lot of athletes I found don't pay that much attention to the Achilles tendon, which is a little bit surprising. So when they go about doing their normal activities, their feet hurt. But I find that their Achilles tendon is really tight. So it's really important to understand to, that your Achilles tendon influences pain in your foot. And then fat pad atrophy. This is uh, could be caused by aging, a steroid injection, or medical condition. So let's go into this in detail. A callus, as you see in this photo, this type of callus is diffuse, meaning it's kind of all over. Most people will have just one single isolated callus in a particular area, very common at the ball of the foot, and it indicates your body trying to protect itself from increased pressure points. So it, it does this by building hard tissue. Over time, if this thickness gets is ignored, it will damage the tissue underneath, causing the skin to open up or have or causes pain. So the treatment options for a callus that's leading to foot pain is to make sure that you have a quality shoe, something that gives you some cushion so that you're using external cushion to support your feet, something like the brand along the lines of a, a Hoka shoe. If you are in the Aptos area, Santa Cruz County area, Fleet Feet and Aptos have really great options for supportive shoes. So you can go check them out. You can also use something like an offloading pad, like what's shown here. I call this a U-pad or a horseshoe pad, and it has a window where it protects the area that has pain. This is a great pad if you have isolated areas of pain because it, as you can see, the window is placed on top to where you have pain. And then when you walk and put your foot down, the pressure is distributed around the pad and it offloads the, the pressure point, the calloused area. 
You can also do daily stretching of your Achilles tendon. This photo shows you that the back leg is being stretched out and you can see the front of the leg is just sitting on top of a step. So you would alternate the back leg to stretch out your Achilles tendon, or you can do this off of the step, floating both of the heels off of the step the way the photo is showing on the left foot, but you would put both feet on and drop one of the heels to stretch the Achilles tendon. You can also use a urea-based lotion to break down that hard tissue. There are products at Costco easily accessible called Amlactin. It has a nice ingredient to help break down some of that hard tissue. Or if you purchase the care cream that I sell in the office, that has a 42% urea concentration. So that is intended for things like calluses to soften it down so that you can gently file it down with a dental foot file. So this can go two ways as far as home care. When you take a shower, your foot is most soft. You can take a gentle foot file and file down some of that hard callus every day so that you stay on top of it. Then afterwards, you would put lotion on. That would be the best way to soften calluses. Calluses come back with time because there are areas of pressure points. And so maintenance is really important. What I wanna say about foot files is that you're not looking to grate cheese. You might've seen some of these crazy equipment online or on social media where people are using really aggressive tools. You want to be careful about what you use. It should only be gentle and take off a little at a time so that you don't cut yourself. Now for advanced treatments of calluses or callus pain, a, a full formal gait evaluation is important to understand how your body moves in relation to the foot. And you might be prescribed a custom orthotic. These are not the same as the inserts you buy at a store or even in those stores that offer scanning of your feet. They are not able to give you the proper diagnosis and the correction that your foot will need. There is a difference between a custom orthotic that is accommodative versus one that is corrective. So knowing the correct type of product for you is going to be really important. Maintenance is going to be the next in line to make sure that the callus doesn't get so thick that it starts to damage the skin underneath. So the home care of shaving it is something that could be done. If you need more professional help, that's something that I do in the office with a sharp blade that I can do safely. Make sure you're not going to a nail salon who is taking a sharp blade to your callus that is not within their scope of practice. So make sure that you seek professional help for this type of problem. I wanna talk about the foot filler injections. This is a newer technology, a newer modality that I offer. It is a way to give you cushion inside of your foot. It's similar in function as a custom orthotic. A custom orthotic is a medical device that we put inside the shoe replacing the old insert with a custom orthotic. So that's an external cushion. We can also do an internal cushion with products that I'll share with you on the next screen. And then lastly, surgery for pain. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about minimally invasive surgery for this type of foot problem in the next couple of slides and the other conditions that follow. But let's talk about foot fillers. This is a temporary option really to avoid surgery and get immediate pain relief. There are a lot of different types. The three main ones that I use include a fat allograft matrix, a product called Lineva, hyaluronic acid, which is a natural substance found in your body, and a collagen stimulating one, one that gets injected and takes time to, for your body to grow or generate collagen to increase cushion. The benefits to these types of foot fillers is that there is no downtime. It's an office procedure. I just need to numb you up a little bit to get this into where it needs to go. This is not a steroid, so it's not stopping the inflammatory cycle directly the way a steroid injection does, but it also doesn't have risks involved like a steroid would. Steroid injections over repeated amounts of times can cause tissue to get weak, 
it can cause fat tissues to thin out. And um, it just works a lot differently than these foot fillers. So there's a place for each of these modalities. The injections, the foot fillers that I do, seems to last around six to 12 months, although the data uh, have, have been reported to last up to two years. I think the difference with the data and with real life is that a lot of the data relies on foot filler products, or actually these are dermal filler products that are used in aesthetics and cosmetic um, practices that is being translated into the foot. And with the foot, having to walk on it all day long, there's increase in pressure. And so that's what I think is the reason why it's not lasting as long as what the data is showing. Nonetheless, it's a nice way to avoid surgery. Now, a little thing about surgery. The reason why I would offer surgery for pain at the ball of the foot is usually for somebody who is at risk for more complication if nothing were to be done. So if a callus were to be ignored, you can see in this photo that the tissue underneath is getting damaged. It's turning purplish, a little bit red from the blood. When that opens up to a full sore or an ulcer, we call it, infection can get introduced. And that's how people who have diabetes or are immune compromised can put themselves at risk for an amputation. So this is considered more of a preventive surgery to address the underlying cause that is causing this callus or ulcer. And I, what I would need to do in this situation is break the bone through a poke hole incision and just let it float. No pins or screws are needed. It's an office procedure done within five minutes or less. And this is a great option for anyone who has a history of a diabetic ulcer that led them in the hospital, infection, even an amputation of a toe. What this is doing it is rebalancing their pressure points and it allows for a faster recovery. So that's when I would suggest surgery. And this is one of my cases a before and after procedure. This was about, this photo was taken about two weeks apart. So before was how they presented. This person already had a history of an ulcer and a prior toe amputation on the other foot. We quickly recognized what was going on on this foot and went to do the procedure. And so you can see the quality of the tissue has improved significantly after the balancing pressure points uh, was performed. So the, the next diagnosis, the Morton's neuroma, this is an, a nerve that gets inflamed and it's called Morton's neuroma when it's specifically in the third and fourth metatarsal. Neuromas can happen anywhere in your body, wherever there is a nerve. And it just happens that somebody named it when they started describing this condition. This can feel like you're walking on a rolled up sock, ball of sock. Feels kind of funny, maybe lumpy on the bottom of your foot, but there's no actual lump on the outside like a callus would be. And it's usually attributed to things like our shoes. The modern day shoes, the toe boxes are too narrow. You can see in the photo, the effects of those types of shoes on the toes, they cause the toes to kind of scrunch together. And when the toes scrunch together, it squeezes on the nerve bundle. So the easiest treatment in this situation is making sure the shoe fits your foot. All of our feet are very different. Just making sure that one that fits yours allows your toes to move freely. Regarding types of treatments for Morton's neuroma, it really starts with the basics, better shoes avoiding barefoot walking. Moving up the ladder, we might introduce a steroid injection and this I limit to maybe three injections per year to minimize some of the problems that's associated with the steroid injection, like weakening of the muscles, thinning of the fat pattern, scarring. Moving up, there are types of injections that, that kills the nerve. We call that a sclerosing injection. However, I've been having issues with purchasing the specific product to do this it went from being really economically affordable to thousands of dollars uh, for a variety of reasons. So that is an option. So if, if you find a doctor who offers a sclerosing injection, that could be an option to burn the, the nerve to reduce the pain. But moving up the ladder, 
A decompressive surgery might be indicated if we've tried all the easy stuff, the padding, the orthotics, the shoes, the steroid injections, and so on, and it's still not giving relief, then we can go in there with a tiny, in tiny incision and release the band that is pushing against the nerve. It's very similar to carpal tunnel in the wrist when the band is released, but the nerve is left alone. So that is considered a minimally invasive approach. And then lastly, the most complex thing that we can do is cut the nerve and remove it entirely. So home treatments, you can get something like this called, I call this a toe alignment. There are a variety of different names and brands. This product I carry in the office and I really like that it's silicone and it's soft. Some of the products on the market are a little bit more rigid and can be very uncomfortable. This is something you would wear at the end of the day. It stretches out your toes, especially because a lot of our shoes squish them together. And when you stretch out your toes and they're properly aligned, when you start to walk around with them on, you are activating the intrinsic muscles. They work better when their toes are better aligned. So I really like this product. The next condition, I bundled this together at, as capsulitis or plantar plate dysfunction or a tear. So relative anatomy, the capsule is what holds the joints together. In this joint, there's fluid that allows freedom of movement in the joints without hearing a creaking sound. That could get disrupted and cause pain. Underneath that capsule, there is a structure called the plantar plate, and that can tear or uh, get interrupted, causing a lot of pain as well. This can happen in repetitive stress. We see this in uh, the military where they're marching for long periods of time. You can get pain at the ball of the foot for that, with that, or steroid injections as well. We diagnose this condition clinically and we might have to order additional imaging with an ultrasound or an MRI to prove or rule out other conditions. The treatment for this, we splint it in an exaggerated position. We call it plantar flexion when the toe is being pulled down with the figure eight type of taping here. If you can do this for six months, this can help it heal on its own without any additional surgery. It's very hard to do. It's a little bit cumbersome to do, but it's, an, it's kind of, it is the best way to protect an area that has dysfunction or pain. We can also introduce regenerative injections, including PRP, which is where we draw blood from your own body. We spin it down and we only collect the platelets part, the part that allows the area to heal, to stimulate healing. There are other different, there are other injections, including amniotic fluid and exosomes and so on. So these are intended for you to heal yourself with the help of an external product. And then lastly, surgery. Surgery could be a direct repair of the plate where we would go in there, make that incision to expose what's needed to be seen from the uh, top or bottom, and then we can sew it together. Or we can indirectly repair or indirectly resolve the pain by doing what we call a floating metatarsal bone osteotomy. This can be done through a minimally invasive technique where the bone is broken to decrease the pressure against the plantar plate or the capsule in hopes that that soft tissue structure heals on its own. Now that the pressure point will be there, it should, it should heal quite well. So that is the last option. A tight Achilles tendon also increases pressure to the ball of the foot. And this diagram shows you by how much. In a high heel as, as high as three inches, it can increase pressure to the ball of the foot by 76%. So that is the significance of wearing high heels and how much that changes the, the pressure points in your feet. There are medical conditions that kind of mimic what high heels do, such as diabetes, because in diabetes, the collagen gets really thick and it decreases flexibility and it can lead to increased pressure points to the ball of the foot. It can also cause hammer toes to, def to um, hematoid deformities to occur because those toes are controlled by tendons and those small little tendons get affected as well. And then just having general neglect, uh, 
not maintaining flexibility can also lead to pain in the ball of the foot. How do we treat a tight Achilles tendon? Physical therapy is always the first line. If that's not sufficient, we can move into surgical lengthening where we have to go in there and make the tendon longer. Uh, that could also be done through a minimally invasive technique or it could be done more in the more um, conventional way to open it up. It just really depends on the anatomy of the individual. We do want to correct the underlying diseases that is causing this stiffness in the tendon. So if somebody has diabetes, we were, we're talking about glycemic control and avoiding high heels when possible when there's pain at the ball of the foot. Lastly, my favorite topic is fat pad atrophy. This is one of the most commonly overlooked condition. And what this is, is you can see in this picture depicting areas of fat concentration. It's high in the heel and it's high in the ball of the foot. When we get older, the fat pad at the ball of our foot usually gets shifted forward or it just thins out. Even in situations where there's steroid injections introduced to this area that can cause the fat to thin out. And the fat is the supportive structure that absorbs shock as you walk. So it's essential to have fat in this area in your body. So the, treating, the treatments for fat pad atrophy, it's similar to everything else, talking about physical therapy, cushioning shoes or custom orthotics and paddings. And, um, and in this photo, we, it shows the before and after of using foot fillers. So foot fillers appropriate in this type of situation too. The top photo shows this patient having a painful callus that was causing this tissue underneath to break down. And then what I offered this patient was a foot filler. And then several months after, you can see how well the callus resolved itself and the skin was able to heal, reducing the pain on this individual. And sometimes, sometimes I might offer minimally invasive surgery as well in fat pad atrophy types of condition especially if the bone's sticking out significantly and it's limiting someone's ability to do what they want to do or want to, to enjoy doing, like walking or running or playing with grandchildren, for example. And then there is still, of course, conventional surgery, which does require a bigger incision and a little bit more invasiveness involved. It's very possible that the foot pain could be relieved with just better shoes and reducing activities that is causing the pain. What I've noticed is a lot of people who are on their feet all day because of their job, maybe it's a postal worker, nurses, teachers even, it's very hard to take breaks throughout the day when you're actively working, right? But it's really important to pay attention to your body and listen and know when to take breaks. So every two hours, take a 15 minute break sitting and resting your feet, for example. That might be all that you need. However, there is also the possibility that there is more going on, that even with the change in shoes and activity isn't resolving the pain. So we have to look at a functional point of view to see if there is a systemic dysfunction that could be addressed with a gait analysis or even with nutrition, because what you eat is really food as medicine. If you're eating really high inflammatory foods, that does get reflected in the way your body feels pain. And so knowing more about what's going on with you individually is important. That's how we take a look at you on a functional level. And then evaluating stress hormones as well. I hope I gave you some information to think about, to have conversations with your doctor, should you have experience with foot pain. If you need a formal consultation with me, you can scan this QR code with your phone. It'll take you straight to my website to schedule an appointment, or you can call the number on the screen or go to the website, 831feet.com. Thank you so much for taking your time out of your day to spend it with me and learn a little bit about taking care of your feet. If you have any questions, please put it down in the comment section below. And that's all I have for today. I'll catch you next Tuesday.